and welcome to episode 12 of The Focus. Today we will be interviewing Daniel Gagnon. Um, I've worked with Daniel for a while and we'll be exploring his experience in the oversight uh, community and experience with oversight in various settings. I'm Aldo Roll. I'm Horia Slushansky and we welcome Daniel. Welcome Daniel. Yes, um, thank you for having me. Great to be here. So Daniel, um, I've known you for quite a number of years um, before uh, PMI purchased uh, or acquired Discipline Agile. You were working for Discipline Agile and I met you on the uh, advisory council uh, right, yeah. in, in, in the years before that. And, and it was always interesting having you on the advisory council and, and listening to some of your perspectives as well as some of the, the, the humorous elements that you're bringing that are always appreciated. Um, and the other reason why we have you here is, is that you participated in the original research we've done with Adaptive Oversight. You were, you were part of the original panels that we in, interviewed to start building up this body of knowledge about Adaptive Oversight. So we thought it would be really be good to look back of what the work we've done some years ago and actually look at how, how everything has evolved since then. Mm -hmm. And the last reason is, is that we're also, on, uh, Daniel is, for, for any of you that don't know this, Daniel is only one of two Discipline Agile fellows. He was instrumental to deliver uh, developing um, discipline Agile along the, alongside uh, Mark Lyons, Scott Ambler, and um, uh, oh, Mark I'm, Lyons. Oh, no, uh, who's the other DA for Mark. Mark. Uh, um, well, Glenn. Glenn, Glenn. Glenn, yeah, Glenn. Glenn Little, yeah. The other, ben Little, the other fellow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, that. Because Daniel has worked uh, in this space quite a lot, he's got a lot of insight, and that's why we invited him to come talk and to focus. Now, before I sing any more praises, Daniel, I'm going to give you an opportunity oh, shucks. To, to sing your own praises. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, yeah, no problem. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with something you probably might not know about my background, is that the first 10 years of my career, I dropped out of college to go work in television. Uh, I worked five years in the studios, doing everything from minor carpentry and painting to miking up the celebs to cleaning up after football games and packing the truck. Uh, after five years of that, I got into, um, I just so happened I'd been painting and drawing all my life. And the first systems were starting to come out for broadcast design. So in my spare time, after my shifts at the station, I would go down to the guy who was operating these systems and I basically glued myself to him. And uh, he taught me the ropes of the system, and because uh, he saw that, hey, if I get sick or if I you know, if I get sick or need a vacation, somebody else can, <laughs> you know. Long story short, I got the job soon after, and um, wound up, you know, being a proficient broadcast designer, animator. I won a Canadian Emmy for a comedy show. It was a, it was great. It was from the ages of 22 to 32. By the time I was 32, it had already become. Believe it or not, a young man's game. I had three young children. Uh, I was running. I was a partnership in a in a small uh, production house. I was working nice. I mean, twelve hour shifts. Uh, my my wife at one point was going, you know, you just has to stop. So, I I, I moved out of that space and uh, got into project management. Uh, the accidental project manager. You want that's that's what I was. Uh, hey, um, I, I I can't take the hours anymore. I'm going to do project management. That's it. That's how you get into it. Right? <laughs> but uh, the reason I'm telling you this is because that was my first brush with true agility during the broadcast design sessions. I did hundreds of commercials where the ad agency, the director, the art, the, you know, the art director and the client would be drinking wine and smoking cigarettes behind me while I'm sitting with, you know, the, well, the director was usually, and you know, just creating designs and, and animations and they're all you know, laughing and talking, and then I don't like that red. And like, wait, make that that's great. Make it make it go faster. So it was real time, agile uh, co creation, whether you liked it or not. And uh, so I got used to this. You know, this is the way 
this is the way client collaboration works, instantaneous. Uh, I even had my own tricks at one point when they had enough wine uh, and somebody wanted a new red, I would just flip menus and screens and represent the same red and go, you knew what I wanted. <laughs> you, you knew, you know them, you know what I wanted. Right. So, but yeah, it became a young man's game, got into project management and then uh, that was a, you know, we were, I was still with the same partner in the same little production house, started doing CD realms, first websites. So I, I drifted into tech project management, you know, just meandered into it. And uh, eventually became uh, moved around uh, various startups in Montreal. Uh, I wound up in, in tech startups as production manager, as executive producer, uh, and, and it was just a, a great time to be, you know, in early thirties. So. But at one point, uh, the, the music stopped, the startup started, uh, 1999, boom, the startup style, you know, the, you know, I remember having 25,000 options at a strike price of $16 and 47 cents. And when I was fired, the stock was worth 10 cents. So, <laughs> well, when I was fired, when I was let go along with everyone else in the company, right? So I went from television to the tech boom, uh, from to project manager to executive producer, and then I had to reinvent myself once again. So. Uh, I mean, I like to say I've risen from my own ashes three times. I'm getting too old for a fourth time now, but uh, I doubt that, Daniel. <laughs> so then, then the rest sort of is history. I got into project management. I started. I I, I hooked up with IT placement firms. Uh, went for my PMP by 2004, 2005. Became a hard ass traditional PMP. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't have recognized me. The the the, the saying went that if you, you know, if you if you wanted three hundred dollars out of out of my budget, you know, you you had to pry it from my kung fu grip. <laughs> <laughs> Until the day that uh, I was assigned to um, uh, a new client in a financial institution, and, and uh, I sat beside a bunch of people who were getting up at, every morning at nine thirty and carrying on and had plush animals and shooting nerfs at each other. So I went to complain about them. I said, who are these clowns? And I don't want to be sitting beside them anymore. I don't know what they're doing, but it doesn't look like work to me. Uh, and they, they said, well, actually, you know what? We wanted to speak to you this afternoon. They're your new team. You've been assigned to their project. They're doing something called Agile. I said, Agile, eh? I'm going to show these clowns how to work. <laughs> <laughs> so I came in with a Gantt chart and, you know, and they're just looking at me. You know, the, first, the, new, the, the first day on the job, I fired the tester. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then see, I figured a little bit of, of my, my thinking at the time was terror when applied in homeopathic doses is also a good management technique. <laughs> so that's how I started out. But um, actually had it coming and there. I actually played right into their hands because I became their hero. That's because nobody else had the, uh, the, 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 the ruthlessness to do it. <laughs> he was a nice guy and I didn't know him from Adam. I walked in. You're out of here. First, first minute of the first day. Uh, anyway, three months later, uh, I was hooked. I was convinced I had drank the Kool-Aid because you know what? This team were delivering. Like I'd never seen any team deliver and they're delivering defect free. So I became an agile project manager with the same team for three and a half years. Um, the scrum master and I became yin and yang. He held, he handled the team impediments. I handled the rest of the organization. We were standing back to back like uh, the two Romans in uh, Rome's HBO there, basically. And that's the way it should work because the Scrum Master freed up his time. He was also a developer and it freed me up to do what I wanted to do. But I started bringing in story point counts and uh, burn down charts into the uh, into the boardroom. <clears throat> and again, I was the first to do that. And everybody else was, did you, see, did you see what he did? He brought burn down charts in. You know, then then the pile of money on the table. How long I would last? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I come out of the boardroom. There's this you know, like pile of money on the table. No, I'm just kidding. But I came out of the board and I I just made a I I'd used my PMP skills to simply say, well, basically based on this new type of data, the project is going very well. Thank you. No one had they had permitted agile to team level, but no one could stomach it at the governance level. So mm -hmm. see my story went my story went somewhere. We went from television to oversight. Proud of myself. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and then I discovered Discipline Agile, met Mark and Scott, and uh, you know, 
uh, that was just a purely, to me, it was the, it, I never saw it as a framework, as you know, although it's a, mm. I, 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 I call it a, a basis for critical thinking, right? And, and that's what I did. So I've been using that approach um, for a decade now, basically, in all my, my, my coaching and, and consulting engagements, basically saying, the first thing I say is, don't worry, you won't be doing stand-ups and user stories and 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 all these things. You won't be forced, you know, you won't be forced to do these things uh, starting next week. We're going to look at what you're doing, take you where you are, bring you where you can. Yeah. Bring you where you can go. And that's it. That's really cool. Um, so you did a little, uh, a very uh, segue by sleuth into the oversight uh, and so on. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I want to take us back to your career doing the design work, uh, getting real-time feedback in the um, yeah. uh, uh, studios that you were working and everybody else was drinking wine. Um, <clears throat> wanted to... I, I had some too sometimes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was free too. Yeah, of course. Um, so... Let's talk a little bit about oversight in that type of context, because that that's really interesting. Um, a lot of uh, what, what, what we grew up with uh, in our careers um, has been focused on the technology space. But how, how do you think oversight has worked there uh, in those days and now in, for instance, the uh, entertainment space? It's a great question. I'll tell you right now, you had to basically, what I had to do was figure out who had the biggest stick. So you had strong directors and weak directors. You had strong art uh, directors and weak art directors. You had very vocal clients and very meek clients. Sometimes the agency was running the show. Sometimes you'd get a strong agency at odds with a strong director. Sometimes you'd get a strong client at odds with a strong art and sometimes you get everyone strong just hashing it out like very loudly and we'd get very little done um, and I just sort of had to have to find inventive ways to keep the conversation moving and I had to choose when to intervene and usually my I said well I turn around and say guys this is costing you a fortune an hour um, I can do it this way I can do it that way uh, your choice I just wanted to remind you that every every minute that goes by, you know, you're you're several green bills in the red. So that didn't deter some of them. Some of them had really deep pockets and didn't care and just loved the arguing. And it was mostly at night. So <laughs> okay, but it was I, I called it uh, unpredictable oversight, or you know, it was hard to do. I had I had to determine who had it essentially i'm that sure was, it's this way to, you hear stories about directors quitting right it's because of these things directors quitting movies it's because of this type of stuff right okay at odds with at odds with the studio script writers quitting or the script gets revised or why, why do you think there's director's cuts of movies i mean it's because of this the director is freed from contractual obligations at one point and uh, gets permission to reuse the material and issue his or her version of how she felt the movie should go. It's because she wasn't in the oversight position at the time. Oh, okay. Oreo? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I find it fascinating how uh, what you're describing sounds so much as an ego struggle, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, completely. So I, I Ego and entertainment? No way. <laughs> it's like piranha fish uh, swarming after a <laughs> prey. <laughs> it's quite uh, quite interesting. Now, um, you know how we use the term oversight um, to have uh, two meanings, right? Of seeing from above and also noticing what are we missing. Right. Um, tell us of, um, of of times of of insight like this where you um, you you stumbled upon fascinating insights. One of my favorite stories about stumbling upon insights is that, and I'm going to take this from an agile perspective later on um, in my career when I was involved in you know when I was actually a senior manager at a large financial institution working with the the enterprise PMO. 
working with, with what we call the control partners, which is the, the various oversight bodies, compliance, finance, security, risk, um, audit, you name it, right? Um, what I realized is that if you took the sort of 20th century agile approach of we're just going to try and work around these guys we're just going to try and you know gate crash we're just going to try that would get you into trouble uh, mm -hmm. nine, 95 times out of 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and i do mean 95 out of 10 not 95 <laughs> out of 100. <laughs> right and yet i saw what i call agilistas just you know sticking to that 20th century outdated notion all because you know they misinterpreted the the agile manifesto what I learned is inclusion of oversight partners, preemptive early inclusion actually can lead to just incredible collaboration. So my story is about audit. We there was one project that called that, you know, that that got in touch with the EPMO for support because they were using an agile approach, which was the recommended um, you know, corporate agile approach, but audit hadn't quite in, quite gotten the memo in terms of, I, I think that was on us on the EPMO, but at any rate, they were worried, there were concerns. So I said, well, I'm gonna to speak to audit and I'm going to, because you guys are doing great. And in fact, they had fantastic traceability, which is what audit is concerned with, right? Audit doesn't want to see form SR71 and make sure that it's in, that it's in Lotus Notes anymore. Audit wants to know that you have a repeatable process, right? And that's, so, uh, I invited, I, I approached audit and I said, listen, you're auditing this rather than do it from your desk um, based on documents. Would you like to come and sit with the team for three weeks? And they'll show you absolutely everything they're doing and how we actually have achieved complete automated traceability from requirement to, to production and code. And there was a silence and I said, sure. So sure enough, they sent down an auditor and, and we did exactly as we promised. We showed her everything and she wound up saying that the process of that agile team was the most auditable process she'd seen in her career. Wow. And that paved the way for other uh, groups, other teams that were using, uh, um, you know, the, the, the corporate approved agile approach, which was largely based on mm -hmm. DA because I'd had, um, you know, I'd had a hand in it. I wasn't this, by any means the sole author uh, um, but I did have a hand in it and uh, I was able to nudge it in a direction of let it, let's be agnostic and pragmatic about it. And that worked because it was a huge, you know, it was a huge institution, 90,000 employees, Canada and US, uh, insurance, banking, credit cards, uh, auto loans, uh, um, uh, uh, discount brokerage, uh, full, full brokerage, you name it. So if anything cried out for context counts, and choice is good, it was this place, right? And every other large institution like it. So yeah, so approach the, the oversight partners and include them, um, make them feel like they're an important part of your process. Don't take refuge in 20th century dogma. Mm. Hide behind something that you've been doing for a long time just because that's, that's all you know. Yeah, but how the change know. is scary, mm. right? um it's it is fearful well in this case it wasn't so much change as abandoning uh, an obviously unsuccessful approach to getting outcome to achieving outcomes in the bank which was trying to circumvent governance and oversight yeah so it becomes a cat and mouse game in the organization and the cats have night vision and, uh, <laughs> and everything else <laughs> everything right which they actually which they actually do anyway so yeah okay. the deck is loaded against the mice <laughs> <laughs> it always is it always is so <laughs> what uh, what keeps you really curious about oversight these days um I'm working with a client right now, uh, just started a um, huge global manufacturer. And now I'm seeing, uh, I thought that a, a large financial institution had a lot of oversight, but this is different. This is from 
engineering to design to production to manufacturing each have their own oversight bodies and the the challenge is going to be first of all for me understanding um how they intricate parts work together and and seeing where i think there's a lot of duplicate i'm sensing there's a lot of duplication and that's what i'm hearing from the interviews i'm, I'm conducting um so the challenge, the fascinating challenge with this is how can, what is common uh, in terms of the objectives and the needs of various oversight bodies in a large global manufacturer that we could actually address in, you know, in a more um, pluralistic fashion than you know, trying to satisfy them one by one. That's my challenge right now. It's still very early days. I could be wrong. Um, I've, I've been proven to be more wrong than right. And I'm glad I have, because that's how, I, how you learn, but uh, could be wrong again, but that seems to be the challenge. That sounds like quite a complex uh, situation because if you're a global uh, organization, you not only have to just compete with your internal things, but you also have to, from an oversight perspective, consider quite a lot of local or, or country specific um, uh, things that you need to deal with as well on, on top of all the legislative um, uh, um, and financial controls and all of those types of uh, things. Um, so Just the, uh, the visuals and trying to achieve universal um, accessibility in terms of the visuals in the user manuals is something I learned today is not an easy task. So it's all, it's, it's, it's really a surprising journey. So uh, it's, uh, it's oversight on steroids. <laughs> okay. Um, over your, your, your uh, career, um, you, you, you gave us a whistle stop tour in the beginning. Um, what were the most frequent struggles you've had in oversight situations? Because from what I hear, hear and understand is, is you we were able to view it from both sides, from yes. the team's perspective, as well as from the uh, PMO, the oversight uh, community's perspective. Um, what's the most uh, frequent struggles that you've had? Getting other people to see both sides. I think I, I am convinced that I have an intrinsic um, bias towards um, empathy because having, you know, I'm half French Canadian, half Irish. So, you know, when it came to politics all my life or, or cultural things, I was always torn. And I realized that when I took too heavily for one side or the other, even in my mind, I was, I was conflicted. So, but what it taught me was um, always see, always look at both sides. I'm forced to with myself every day. And then I married a, a German woman. My, and my, my sons are half German, a quarter French and a quarter Irish. So now it's not, now I'm really like, uh, like in my personal life, I've had ample opportunity to learn to look, always look at things from numerous perspectives, at least two. So that comes naturally to me and I'm sort of taken aback and um, uh, I, I just try as I may, I try to empathize with people who see only one side, but to me, it's like a foreign um, way of being and it's a bias, I, I can't escape it. it. It's a blessing and a curse. Sometimes it has been helpful other times it's been detrimental. And I tend to sometimes be seen as overly compromising because of it. So there are times when uh, teams have become impatient with my approach because they feel that I'm giving in too much to the man, right? Times when the corporation has been, you know, the client has been, well, you know, you shouldn't, you know, you gotta see, you know, it's not just, you're not here just to help the team as you're helping. And uh, in the meantime, I'm, you know, basically torn between, I'm frequently torn uh, is, um, by nature, by upbringing, by, uh, so getting others to see and, and, and exp convincing others, not convincing, but 
advocating for both sides um, is is how I have you know turned that bias into action and inquiry as well, active inquiry into the needs of both sides. Does that make any sense? Absolutely makes makes a lot of sense, and that's what a, a lot of what our model is built up uh, is actually having that mechanism and uh, approach in order to take the views of both sides on balance. Um, you you know you saw that those balances uh, that we've explored, you you participated in those, and yeah. and, and, and yeah, that, it's all about that. Yes, and. and um, I'm really uh, want to just put it out there to everybody listening to this that, that Daniel, I don't think you're the only person that struggles with that. Um, uh, I hope not. That would be very lonely. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a lot of people that can see both sides, and what they struggle with is is to actually make it visible to both sides. So um, that, that that was quite. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Now, th this is your personal struggle, um, but you've also dealt with quite a lot of other people um, and you've rubbed shoulders with um, the man out there, etc. cetera. Um, what do you notice <laughs> um, others struggle with in, in oversight situations? Others being uh, just... To... Other, uh, either uh, oversight practitioners or... Uh, initiative uh, members of initiatives what do you okay. notice uh, others struggle with so i'll start with oversight practitioners um they are prisoners of they're usually prisoners of a system that reward the practice of oversight rather than the um, enterprise outcome that the oversight function is there to fulfill in the first place so they're rewarded them by output right so many audits successfully, so many security forms and checkpoints successfully completed. So they lack unity of purpose by, by design or by negligence. I don't, I'm never sure which. So they basically, uh, and I mean, not on the part of the practitioners, but on the part of the, of the organization. So oversight practitioners who are ready to do what, you know, the, the auditor I was talking about, and, and her boss who allowed it are, it's not that frequent. I, I would like to hope it's becoming more frequent and people mm -hmm. are coming to the realization that you need to get out of the, well, I'm gonna say sort of need to get out of, you know, your, your, your office uh, in order to exercise oversight. You need to do the Gemba walk, right? From the team side, they feel this, they feel this, but rather than, again, try to see the other side, they have a tendency often to retrench even further saying, well, we can't change them. You know, their, their mission in life is to make life difficult for us. Right? So I, I have a good memory of um, infrastructure. Again, in another financial institution, the, uh, the head of, um, you know, IT infrastructure, you know, he had a reputation of basically uh, it was like a Dilbert cartoon, right? Users are a threat to the system, right? So people just started, you know, finding ways to minimize or camouflage or, or otherwise obfuscate anything that was set, anything that would trigger him in terms of his overly sensitive uh, defense of his infrastructure. But he wasn't, defending the organization he was defending his infrastructure forgetting that the infrastructure was there to serve the organization that's how it felt mm. when you look at his behavior it was not in his head maybe in his mind the organization <laughs> was what he was defending but to anyone looking it really seemed because no are he was impermeable to argument right if it always seemed to boil down to if it threatens the infrastructure, the infrastructure in even the most mundane way, it's not going in. So you touched on quite an important uh, point here that I'd like to explore a little bit further. Um, one of the things that um, 
you mentioned or, or the story that you shared was that inward focus. Um, and maybe this is a leading question. So just bear with me. Um, <laughs> would you say that that type of things happen when the organization or both sides of that equation, the oversight community, as well as the, um, or one of those sides of that equation, lose focus on uh, actually how they deliver value to the end customer? It's exactly it. There's no unity of purpose in terms of who is the end customer. And, and I know it's a cliche, but it becomes uh, fiefdoms. Yes. Right? Fiefdoms. And to me, that is a failure of the very top leadership. It is up to the very top of the house to make or break, you know, either unity of purpose or allow fiefdoms to proliferate. But it's not only unity, it's also clarity of that purpose, because if it's interpreted in more than one way, then obviously you're not going to get people seeing it in that, the same way. That's a, that's a very good point. Yes. Yeah, clarity precedes unity. <laughs> okay. Of it that way, but you're right. Yeah. Okay. Clarity and unity of purpose uh, are the remit of the top of the house. I like yes, the word that's... unity. Thank you. That that we, we just keep talking about clarity uh, in uh, when we discuss, but the, I think the word unity is an important um, thing we 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 keep forgetting. And that and that, I was forgetting you... clarity. So now we have both have a fuller <laughs> way of. But but unity also speaks to um, the the process you have to go through, not just mm -hmm. to achieve consent but also um, consensus maybe you don't get consensus but at least you can achieve consent yeah um, what do you want to say something i can see you leaning in here <laughs> yeah um i think this is very much related to um, a, a thorny issue of um equality Right, we are um, accustomed to the to the intuition that we're all equal, and therefore we believe that everyone's opinion should be equal. When in reality, that doesn't happen. It hardly ever happens. And while it's true that in some respects we're absolutely equal, in others, we don't have by a long shot any kind of equality. So uh, to, to give some, some more specific examples, um, if I have practiced at something for five years and um, you've only just tried your hand at it uh, for a few minutes, we're not equal in that. Let's say it's learning to play guitar. Yeah, Definitely not. Yeah. So <laughs> if, if I've had five years of daily practice at guitar, I'll have um, probably some form of at least passable uh, proficiency with it. Yeah. So therefore, uh, if there's a brand new novice at guitar, pitted against the five-year practitioner, they're not equal at all. Now, will that person that has only just tried their hand be able to develop and achieve parity of skill potentially? Yeah. But right then, right at that moment, they're not equal. Yeah. So um, a fundamental- I'm not sure that- I'm not sure that I don't want to interrupt. I'm not sure that it, you know, the belief in equality is as pervasive as you say it is, though. Oh, um, I was not so much saying that the the belief in equality is pervasive. It's more um, there's this expectation when you're you're finding yourself into a contentious forum that all our opinions ought to carry reasonably equal weight, right? Ah. That, that's where I'm coming from. But what we're missing often is this, uh, hold on a second, 
but <laughs> they can't carry uh, uh, equal weight if you want to get a really great result. Because if you're somehow through some accident, you're surrounded by people that have hardly any deep, effective insight into it, their intuitions might be completely wildly wrong. So the minority opinion that's well informed is going to be drowned by the majority opinion that's novice. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that, so, or you get the phenomenon in a boardroom where a, a more junior or slightly marginalized member will timidly say, offer an idea, and it gets shoved aside. And then an hour later, a senior member brings up the same idea and it's applauded. That's called mansplaining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to just ask a question here at this stage because it sounds to me it's also. How much of a function of organizational design is this phenomenon? Mm -hmm. Can you design for that to counter it? To mitigate it? Yeah. yeah. Or even avoid it? Ask uh, Tony, uh, what was his name? I never know how to pronounce his name. Uh, the guy from Zappos, or if she, if she, yes, she, you know, uh, who tried holacracy at uh, Zappos and apparently wasn't. Uh, wasn't quite a success. I'm just pulling that out of my hat as an example, but it was an example of design for equality and no hierarchical structure. Coming back to DA, the one thing, or, or in, in, you know, in general, um, one thing about uh, that unity and clarity of purpose. You know, uh, DA specifically says that we should give teams, you know, choice and the freedom to basically forge their own way, but it never advocates full autonomy because that would be chaos. We still need a binding vision, right? We still need that clarity and unity of purpose, right? Because otherwise everyone's inventing their own login or <laughs> re re repeating the wheel. So as a function of organizational design, how far do you get in terms of quality, in terms of breaking down the hierarchies, in terms of destroying the silos, and in terms of pushing decisional authority down? And when does it stop being effective and become almost toxic? I haven't the experience to, to fully formulate uh, a hypothesis on when that cutoff point happens. I would imagine it'd be different in each organization. But... So the hire model comes to mind uh, what they've done with hire and, 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 and mm -hmm. what they've attempted to, to, to deal with exactly that, uh, that point. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and um, there, there may be quite a lot of uh, knowledge or information in order to, to if we explore that, to, to deal with that. That's really interesting. Um, I want to move on with the interview and, and maybe we'll come back to this again. Yeah, um, that was definitely a meander, but it was fun. Uh, very <laughs> cool. Um, well, that, that's where the richness happened. Uh, that's where yeah. we find, find, find the, the, the cream. Mm -hmm. um, what other struggles that you notice uh, uh, in, uh, in, in your, in your um, a career that others struggle with in oversight situation? Uh, I think the um, the poor timing of oversight um, in, uh, involvement. So I really believe in all something I've always pushed for is uh, you know the famous uh, left shift, mm. right? Everybody talking in IT. Everybody talks about you know we have been talking for a while and like things like DevOps about left shifting you know uh, tests and and like user acceptance testing with uh, you know BDD and things like that. That's all well and nice, but if you don't left shift um, oversight, you're just going to be heading for a wall faster if you've got all the technology down, mm. right? And you're just going to entrench the old behaviors as well if you don't do that. And, you know, in left shifting security, for example, and, and data, data is a big one too. Yeah. Um, data and security need to be far more left shifted than they, than they are presently from, from my limited experience, at least. Um, because otherwise, as I said, you're speeding, you're speeding and the day before deployment, uh, although, you know, <laughs> 
many, you know, there's a lot of automated deployment now, but you know, big deployments still need some human oversight. And when you talk about human oversight, there's also, you know, there's still forms in most places and most places aren't Amazon or, or LinkedIn, right? Uh, deployment is still an event in, in most organizations, uh, mm. despite the advances of DevOps. So if you leave the oversight, if you, if you, if you don't see to the oversight, because you're doing DevOps and it's going well and you've got the technology, you're going to be stopped in your tracks just as we were in the old days of, in the days of waterfall. Yeah, that, that whiplash is quite jarring. Um, oh yeah, that, <laughs> the faster you go, you'll be in a neck brace for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, but this, this, that, that effect also has got some real damage to morale. Of course, of yeah. course. And then teams even you know turn on their their development pipeline and stop stop uh, lose faith in it because well what's the difference I've spe- I've I've automated all my tests and it's great we're just going to get stopped by a, a an Excel form we have to fill out at the last minute because yeah. we didn't think of it right or somebody changed it and didn't tell us or somebody introduced a new form or a new check you know a new control that. You know, they did. They failed to communicate. And oh, 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 wait a minute! Before you hit that button, have you filled out SR seven three one? Can we automate SR seven three one? How? How do you automate SR seven three one? And and there's a there's a perennial difference between no organization on earth really can fully afford a a pre deployment and a completely identical production environment, right? I remember at one institution there was 33 or 34,000 different known differences between the closest thing to production and production in terms of configuration. Wow. wow. How do you how do you plan for that, right? Well, just taking off my my uh, interviewer hat and putting on my tester hat. Um, I've spent a whole career in testing in a previous life. You and... know this one better than I. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, I'm glad I'm not that this manager that has to uh, explain explain all of that. So, oh yeah, and I mean it's getting easier with obviously the, you know things are advancing quickly with with you know you know cloud and automation and, and DevOps, which is, or none of this none of which are my specialty. Right. Uh, the only time I actually saw a line of code, one of my friends likes to joke, is when I accidentally hit a function button on Firefox and I saw the HTML. <laughs> okay. That hasn't good. stopped me from. <laughs> shouldn't have. Maybe you can excise that from the recording. <laughs> <laughs> the trauma, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's no question. laughs> um, thank you for that. Uh, so shift left is definitely there, and I, I believe that there are some examples. I've heard of examples of uh, uh, Barclays and ING. Barclays in the US, UK, and ING in the Netherlands have tried to do some things like that. So there, there could be some case studies that uh, that can be explored. Thank you for that, Daniel. Oh yeah, I'm sure it's not impossible. It's just hard. <laughs> One thing you said, uh, Daniel, um, I'm really intrigued by, uh, it's this notion of toxicity um, uh, that uh, we come across from time to time. And yet I don't know that we've, defined or or put our finger clearly on how do we recognize a toxic environment and um what could be some some things to do to purify or detoxify the environment um what thoughts do you have in this space oh this is actually one of my biggest areas of current interest so i i've been delving into the whole area of psychological safety looking up you know the uh, the various thought leaders from Going back to Amy Evanson to uh, Tim Clark, I actually certified on on Tim's uh, four steps approach, and uh, I'm certified to give workshops, which I have yet to do. But I have uh, worked with another practitioner to give a more uh, generic workshop. Um, in order to define toxicity, we have to define psychological safety, and there's a couple of definitions of that. Amy Edmondson's back in '99 was, you know, a place where people can actually uh, speak up and uh, not feel threatened. Um, but then Tim Clark came along just before and he, he 
nuance things a lot. He said, there's actually four stages of psychological safety. The first is inclusion, mm. right? And you're allowed that, you have a right to that as a, as a human being, right? Unless you're an ax murderer, uh, you should be included. The second is the right to uh, the right to learn from from your teammates and to be shown things and to be brought into the fold and taught how taught the team's norms and uh, whatever technical knowledge you're missing. The third is basically now you're allowed to contribute, right? So you can basically the team is oh okay you why don't you work on this and uh, you know we'll we'll revise it but uh, uh, welcome to the team in the terms of now you're actively contributing. And the fourth, the fourth is the one that counts. The fourth is where the rubber hits the road and where you really know that you have psychological safety. That's challenger safety. So if you stand up and challenge the CEO in a town hall in front of everybody, are you walking out with a cardboard box the next day or not? Until that is achieved, people will withhold their creativity. People will withhold innovation. Um, they will withhold engagement. They need to see the fourth step. Everything else is table stakes now. It's the VIG. So toxicity basically can exist in all four levels, right? Uh, at the first level, it's a toxic environment if you have people that we're excluding. And you add to that, you get to the second level. It's toxic if we aren't allowing people to learn and we're excluding people. At the third level, if we're excluding people, keeping some from learning, keeping others from contributing, you're getting very toxic. And then the fourth, you can all guess it, the ultimate toxicity is when all three are, are there and also you wind up busking for food the day after you ask the CEO a tough question in public. So toxicity, just like any poison, depends on the dose, right? So uh, the, the, the lower the the lower the lower you are in the steps, the lower the dose. But by the time you're at the fourth step, it is uh, basically, uh, you know, can be career ending. It sounds to me you've just explained of what happens in modern politics, but I'll move that aside. <laughs> <laughs> because I see a lot of what you've just shared. Um, yeah. We see we see quite a lot of wokeism. We see a lot of exclusions. We see a lot of us versus them. Um, so anyway, but that, that happens in organisations as well. Yeah. Um, the, the the parallel between the safety and the and the to the toxicity. Um, what other uh, aspects of of those links have you uh, seen? Um. What is fascinating to me is when you reverse engineer this model to your career, you see when you've been in toxic situations and actually survived the poison, right? And it explains also uh, some post-traumatic stress disorder things that we may have from certain portions of our career. So uh, coming across that model for me was, uh, was like a, an aha moment because it really, you go, okay, you know, I, 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 frankly, you can go back to high school with some, something like in, inclusion, right? Walking by the cool kids table and they all turn away, right? You have to go and sit, you know, or being the last chosen for basketball, right? Or these are all um, lack, of, lack of inclusion and they hurt. Mm -hmm. We've all experienced them from school to careers to family so we we bear the scars of these toxic moments right but we also can overcome them and one way to overcome them is to understand them and realize them and face them mm. um, yeah learning about this model actually made me face a lot of the toxic moments in my life sort of a reflection thank you daniel uh, all right. So we spoke briefly uh, earlier about um, uh, ways of looking at the world like uh, discipline agile. Um, what's your perspective on how, um, let's call them more broadly, frameworks might be able to either help or hinder 
um, efforts of improving oversight? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one because there's a, there's a lot to say about that. Um, another thing that I've come to, another conclusion I've come to in my career is that, and I am fo almost exclusively focused now on training and coaching leadership. Um, I, I, with the psychological safety, with, uh, uh, you know, I'm a, a guide for Agile Leadership Journey. Um, uh, a partner and I um, created an IC Agile course on for, for beginning leaders. Um, so when it comes to frameworks, there, there are two phenomena I've noticed. Frameworks either come from a grassroots attempt at changing the culture. And I love what uh, Jonathan Smart says, grassroots, grass ceiling. Right, so grassroots at grassroots attempts for the last 25 years of making an entire organization embrace a framework have met with a pretty mitigated success, to say the least. Then you have the opposite side of the spectrum with with the later later frameworks meant to 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 work for larger numbers of people and teams where these tend to be more or less imposed from the top with the same hope that it'll permeate the organization in the latter case it's a question of removal of agency agility is supposed to be about agency but when you impose a framework from above, because it is the, you know, it's what all the other big kids are doing, uh, you've just killed agency. And if you kill agency, you have no hope in hell of achieving organizational agility. In the former case, when you try to grow from grassroots, you will never actually achieve any traction with oversight, achieve any traction with leadership, because the frameworks that tend to be brought up from grassroots are old and have at their core a toxic uh, mistrust of leadership and management to the point of excluding any leadership roles. So what are you left with? You're left with failure from below and failure from above, All right? To me, the reason the thing that attracted me to, to Discipline Agile and, and now to, to, to leadership training and coaching is that you can't force a culture to change from the outside. You can only work with it. And the only way to work with it is to take them where they are mm. and give them options. Um, there is one approach that professes to take people where they are and go by simple steps but it is limited and it does not teach you to go beyond it, just like the others. So frankly, you know, I, I survey what's happening in the agile world right now. And I've been saying this for years and it's the agile industrial complex. Mm -hmm. um, and there's studies out there that have shown that, you know, when you take the, uh, when you take the imposition route, if you even do get it even mildly implemented, your bump, at, at that level is four to five percent increase in productivity maybe do you really want to revolutionize and remove everyone's agency for five percent which is nothing right doesn't really move a needle mm. yeah but my biggest my biggest single um and, and and this is a, you know a way of framing it that I actually got from Scott Ambler is you know, frameworks don't teach you to outgrow them. They have no interest in that. You know they want you know they want supplier lockdown. Yeah, so you can sell something or lock more. in. Yeah, lock, supplier lock in. Yeah, and on selling. Oh, we've got this new add-on. Oh, we've got mm -hmm. this new this or version X. Yeah. Uh, that's, Interesting. That's, that's what I find uh, um, 
and I, and I see, you know, I, I was working, I was actually giving a, a leadership class to a bunch of folks at another client uh, yesterday where they're implementing one of the, one of the large, you know, scaling frameworks. And, you know, they thought that they were coming into another sort of methodology class. And they said, my God, <laughs> it's so refreshing to not talk about methodology and not talk and to actually get to the real issues that, you know, so that was a good feeling. Okay, so thanks for that, uh, Daniel. Um, so two years ago, you were part of the original uh, panel uh, that we interviewed and uh, that, that, that we started putting together our, our model. Um, I and still remember my, 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 my fondest memory of my contribution with that. You, your fondest memory of my contributions, what was it? <laughs> you call it Rasputin coaching. So, <laughs> okay. yeah. for, for our audience, um, what is your definition of Rasputin coaching? Um, it's basically, um, you know, I've seen, unfortunately, people call themselves agile coaches and they're just selling a dogma and their biggest and most obvious um loyalty is to themselves and uh if you dare disagree you know, you'll you, you know you know the thunder the thunder of rasputin shall be upon you right mm. and rasputin the historical figure you know yes was not was not known for his mild manners nor his humble humility nor his sanity so maybe the sanity part i don't apply to but definitely the uh you know the the conviction, the utter conviction conviction of being right, and the use of even sarcasm and toxicity to put people down who who don't see the obvious. Right? So there's quite a lot of things that you've just shared uh, from coaching perspective. Um, we we the modern days, I think it's called cancel culture. Uh, yeah. Is that some of the same behaviors that you that you see that you would equate to Rasputin coaching? Uh, can you can you elaborate a bit what you mean by that? Uh, how you're equating the two, or uh, so that behavior on cancel culture is from coming from that perspective is that because you disagree with me, I'm just going to shut you shut you down. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, no, I think this type type of behavior is a little bit distinct from cancel cancel culture. It's it's a simple inability to stand being disagreed with and a profound conviction of being right. I think cancel culture is more of a sociological movement. I think this is more psychological. Okay. Thank you for that, for, for, for clarifying that. So coming back to my original question, that research that, that you participated in, um, there was quite a lot of insights that we generated through the through the groups uh, that, mm -hmm. that we participated in, and I think you you sat in on about ten sessions with us. You 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 sacrificed. And they're all at seven a.m. <laughs> <laughs> you sacrificed ten weeks of your life uh, to to mm -hmm. to this. Um, not ten you... days, not ten weeks, or ten yeah, mornings. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's fair. Quite enough. starting at seven, so that counts for double. Double okay. Time. <laughs> okay. So, um, looking at your participation and uh, the insights and the learning, then, and looking at where the world has moved on to where we're at now, because we 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 started doing that just before and during the 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 first wave of this. Yep. Uh, um, phenomenon that we all experienced called a uh, pandemic. Um, how has the world moved on since since well, we, that that does that that discovery? Well, you know, I think if you take the combination of pandemic, war, supply chain disruptions, uh, further social and political polarization, the the, the threat of hunger, further climate uh, destabilization, growing inequality. I think we're doing fine. 
um, in terms of, you know, I was joking a little bit at the end, but all that has been incredibly gone exponential since we worked on, on that. I would love to revisit some of those mural boards and see, you know, exactly what we came up with. I'm sure we would look at it in a different lens now. I admit I don't have enough, I don't remember enough of the specifics to say, well, you know, look at this, <laughs> how naive were we? Because I don't, you know, I don't remember the specific, but I'm sure if we look back at with the lens of today, we would see things that uh, that have fundamentally changed probably forever. Okay. I just couldn't pinpoint what. So, so to put you on the spot, um, what what do you think could be one of those things? We looked at oversight in a specific uh, uh, following that framework and that thinking. What what is an example of something that could have changed? Um, well, take um, take um, people management. Mm. Um, the trends that have been initiated now, um, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but they profoundly affected the way we manage people, at least the companies who want to survive. Right, the ledger has gone black on the side of um, people, the employees, the, the, the contributors, as opposed to the hiring entities. And there's been a, in fact, a redefinition of what it means to be an employee, what it, you know, um, I think we may even get to the point where the notion of an employee is, becomes, becomes nonsensical. And you know everybody gets to a point where not every. Not, I mean, let's talk more about knowledge work. But certainly in knowledge work, there's at this point there's little reason to be content to be an employee if you actually, you know, look at if you have the leap of faith to to make the jump. Um, and people managers, um, I think have to fundamentally, they won't be able to go back to the carrot and the stick. And uh, the best we can do for you is we can't give you a raise, but we'll give you a seat by the window, right? What window? I have, I'm working from home, right? Um, so those, those things in terms of oversight, in terms of how we manage people, I think are fundamentally changed for the rest of our lifetimes. Mm. Uh, that's, a, that's, a hedge, that's a hedgeable bet. That's one example that comes to mind. Um, so what I'm hearing is, is it will be challenging uh, uh, um, older thinking and models of performing oversight. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that's more people oversight. Um, what about overseeing um, initiatives and products and so on? Well, one of the trends that emerged obviously is the breaking apart of the global supply chain, right? So um, once that has started, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> right? You it is it is spurred uh, i was just reading today that uh, canadian supermarkets have just introduced uh, um you know they're they're falling over each other introducing hundreds of now locally sourced products right uh which are obviously a bit more you know expensive or whatever but actually no more expensive now than dragging it from halfway across the world you know so it's it's sparking uh it's sparking a rethinking of supply chains. It's going to uh, fundamentally alter um, international relationships in, in, over the over the long term. Mm. I I believe if you look at it, if you just extrapolate from what's happening, right? So, uh, man, you've got me on a spot here. These are tough questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but th those are the best ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, so that implies that uh, what, what you just uh, explained is, is that the nature of over or the, the practices or the approaches to oversight would also be changing. Because you're not importing something from a different country anymore and you need to source it locally, you need to adjust uh, quite a lot of your approaches uh, in terms of oversight. Yep. Yeah. And the companies that, that that's going to really struggle with this are the ones that's going to keep clinging to the old old ways. Um, okay. Very, very yeah. fascinating. Clinging to the old ways in general is is you know it, it is just um, it's the kiss of death now. Mm. Okay. So what do we do about it? How do we um, help people to? discover an action that will overcome that in our private spheres in in terms of our day-to-day -day work with clients in terms of social activism where what sphere what level well uh, walk us through um the the onion rings okay um well you know i've already if i look at my current client in the agents i, I mean i and the way i i i, I I teach leadership now is one of the, you know, it's one of the first things we say now is you cling to the old ways and you cling to command and control, which is an obvious one, but now more than ever, more than ever, it is unsustainable to try and apply 20th century or even early 20th century, early 21st century practices. There has been a global reset and the faster that you actually educate yourself and and and, and practice uh, becoming a you know um, a more flexible more more aware leader um, the more chances you have of, of thriving I love the notion of as you know the no, also the notion of anti-fragility I think we mm. need to aim for anti-fragility right resilience is not resilience itself is no longer enough because those who get it will be anti-fragile and will be thriving on this mess while you're just staying put. So in client work, you know, uh, it's definitely, you have to, we have to be uh, the, you know, the, the harbingers of, of the news and, and just repeat and repeat and repeat that uh, it has never been more imperative to lose the old ways. In terms of our social spheres, our personal lives, I think that every conversation, um, without becoming a over, uh, an insufferable bore, but there are numerous opportunities to, to to introduce you know things like this into into our intimate circles as well, um, and ultimately that also involves educating ourselves, and that's I think educating ourselves and and understanding what's going on is both the biggest challenge and also the source of biggest reward because. If we don't know what the heck's going on, we can't certainly can't affect anyone else. I mean, we in the general sense, anyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what would you recommend as a as a regime of education and understanding? How would we develop those uh, those abilities, those skills? Get out of your echo chamber if you find yourself in one. Uh, that's hard, All right? But that's the one, you know, that's the one message I would, I would send everyone on earth is if you find yourself in an echo chamber, escape. But people don't want to. How do yeah. you, how do you square that circle, right? Yeah, how that's an you, interesting challenge. How do you know you find yourself in an echo chamber if you're not aware of it? How do you become aware, aware of it? it? Yeah, yeah. How do, you, how do you become aware of it, right? So... I, I, we all personally know people in their own. We are all in an echo chamber to a certain extent, right? The three of us are in our own little echo chamber right True. now. Yeah. Our viewers are in the echo chamber. I would like to believe that our echo chamber has, you know, the walls are, give us a bit more breathing room and maybe there's some, some, some bamboo like your guys. By the way, that's a new picture. Yes, it is. That's uh, for the, for the focus uh, okay. precisely. Yeah. It has layers to it, right? Yeah, I like it. But yeah, we're all in echo chambers. Um, and just being aware of it is the first step. Right? Mm. And 
getting getting out of it. So my message, and if I could to anyone, is you know, try to. What we should invent an echo chamber test or something. Right? <laughs> you know, clap, and if you don't hear anything coming back, you're in an echo chamber. <laughs> or a very large one. <laughs> or just a very large one. <laughs> Yeah, but we're sitting on now. We're we're talking in one now. It's just we don't we take it for granted, right? So that's that's the pernicious thing about echo chambers is we're all in our own. Well, I think it has to do with curiosity and how willing are we to to question our way of of seeing things. Um, the more we become deliberately seeking. Um, to, to look at things from, uh, from a diversity of perspectives, the, the better things get. But that is so hard because you hear uh, you, people saying, I don't understand such and such a category of, uh, of people. And the more we talk about not understanding each other and not seeing the world through each other's perspectives, the more we are in, in difficulty. So this polarization um, has uh, a lot of interesting contributors. Um, and I've, I've seen it um, happen in, um, in, in various settings. So I, I find fascinating how hard it is to deliberately suspend judgment and say to yourself, look, uh, let me try and put myself in the other person's viewpoint. How is this person looking at the world? And How it comes this... back to my earlier comments, right? About being, being, I'm not, I'm bicultural, right? So, and I've actually, I'm almost tricultural with my, you know, with my, the German side of, you know, my children and everything. So my former wife. So that's not everybody has that though, right? Or I've, you meet people who, you know, I'm always fascinating. I'm always fascinated. And I meet people and I go on their last name and I say, well, you must be, and I take a guess, you must be Hungarian, right? So do you, do you speak it or, oh yeah, well, yeah, I think it's Hungarian. Like, it's, it's I, I can't believe that people would not know and be proud of their origins. I, I picked Hungarian as a, as, as a sort of rabbit out of my hat example, but I, I actually kind of stopped it because I got disappointed by the, uh, the, the glib sort of, oh, yeah, I think so. But now I'm just Anglophone, or now I'm just American, or now I'm just this, or, right? It's like, wow. Yeah. Well, um, this seems to be more of a, a broader malaise, this one of um, not really um, finding a, a, a deep connection between humans anymore, right? Because In your past. Um, um, it's, it's, it's strange how humans seem to have some, some deep, um, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to use the word religious impulse, right? But there's something because religio, the, the word itself comes from, from Latin. It, it's about relinking. But unfortunately, religion has been sort of colored by really strange and and yeah, oh yeah, That's, uh, re really painful behaviors. Yes, yeah? it has. Well, throughout history, right? So, I mean, exactly. So, so therefore, uh, it's very easy to make um, a, a fundamental error in logic and say because these people that call themselves religious, engage in these habits that are so painful and, and vile, surely then all religion is um, devoid of all merit and, um, uh, and, and therefore we should not consider it. But the thing is, yep. what do you do with that impulse for deep human connection? Because equally so, you look at most of the, um, shall we say, belief system uh, traditions, and virtually every single one of them says something along the lines of there's unity. There, there's, um, oh, yeah. the, the Greeks talk unity. about agape, yeah? 
yeah. uh, as in this form of love that kind of brings us all together yeah. in, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, sort of wholesome and, and sort of, uh, I don't even have proper words because you, you, you'd use things like sisterhood and brotherhood, but it's, it's, it's different. And, and it's across uh, any kind of um, chromosome uh, differences or, or anything wow, like you- that. You're really out of the echo chamber now. <laughs> so, but where where I'm coming from is, um, I think we we um, we may benefit a lot from uh, from looking at each other as as, as fellow humans. And, and and strive to see from each other's perspectives a lot better so that we can form more more trust in one another because the more we learn to trust one another the more we see a mutual win-win uh, the better things get and as opposed if, to zero sum right exactly in, it seems like what we, a lot of what the polarization we're seeing today is everybody is caught in zero sum thinking mm-hmm. all right for me to win you got to lose there's no two ways about it, buddy. <laughs> right? And that's completely false. Oh, well, well, that's an interesting challenge for us then. Um, escaping um, zero-sum thinking. Uh, let's, let's become escape artists and get out yeah. of zero-sum thinking, eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, what is it? The, like uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing that has more room than a full heart. Wow, that's so cool. That's yeah. beautifully said. Yeah. Daniel, um, we're drawing to a, a close here uh, f- uh, for um, the the this this recording and the, this interview. But in closing, um, what else would you like to share with us? Um, on what we've discussed today and what we found? I'd like to share maybe an insight on my own career and where it's going. And I think it's a, a reflection of um, maybe we should, more of us should in, in our little echo chamber of you know um, organizational design and coaching and so on. Um, um, I have gotten to the point where I, I'm almost painfully aware that I have done, probably done damage during my career at some point by giving false hope. Mm. By giving false hope to people within organizations that, you know, had I been aware enough at the time, I would have seen the signs that leadership wasn't ready. Mm. I would have seen the signs that we were in a grass ceiling situation. I, I'm beginning to see it now very clearly, but my younger self, you know, um, well, not that much younger, but, but uh, uh, so even less excuse, but um, I, I, I really feel like I, I, not intentional, you know, harm, but uh, I'm, by my actions and those of my colleagues, uh, I'm sure many of us have instilled a false hope. And that's, that's, that's a false hope is a very, uh, mm. uh, very uh, damaging thing. Uh, hopefully anyone that I, that I cause to have false hope uh, for their, for their teams or for their division or for their company, you know, uh, will forgive me and my brethren, my coaching and consulting brethren. But uh, yeah, I, I'm determined not to make that mistake. I'd anymore. like to, I'd like to, to challenge uh, that uh, a fair bit, Daniel, if you'll allow me. So um, let's see if I got the, challenge away. The, the, the definition of false hope. So the definition of false hope in this context, I take it to mean um, we didn't notice something, uh, and we inspired people to behave in certain ways that were intended to, to get things better, and yet other people outside of our direct awareness have acted in such a way as to stifle or interfere with or, or otherwise undermine our efforts for improvement. That's, that's, yeah? that's pretty much what I meant, yep. Okay, cool. So in that case, I don't think 
it's on us as purveyors of hope to um, remonstrate ourselves and, oh, well, we've done wrong in instilling hope because it's not on us that the stifling has happened. Yes, we could do better in being more insightful and be better prepared and have a better chance of success, but taking yes. away the hope is not an antidote, I believe, right? So um, put it this way, uh, if I'm a bully, I'm gonna keep bullying until somebody pushes back in some way that convinces me enough that this bullying behavior is not paying off anymore. Mm -hmm. This doesn't work anymore. But if I get away with it, I'm going to keep at it. Yeah. So I see it very much that what we're doing with our with our professions is we're revolutionaries figuring out ways to stand up to bullies and yes, inspire that, people. That definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And inspire people that there's better ways of working. There's better ways of engaging with each other in a manner that is deeply human, deeply rooted in that kind of unity that we were speaking earlier, that kind of um beyond zero sum game into synergy into figuring yeah. out that one plus one is 57 yeah it's like whoa so much better when we work together 50, 56, 56. <laughs> okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i was gonna go for 42 but okay <laughs> oh, see that's the better number isn't it yeah <laughs> But the point here is, um, I, know, I like where you're going with this. Yeah, we, 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 um, uh, I don't think it's false hope. What, what I think it is, is practice, right? So I, I look at it more as a discipline. You've got to practice to get better. And we've gotten better by noticing, whoops, it looks like false hope. Uh, so you could be interpreted as for hope, but what we did is we got reps in, we practice, we practice, we practice, and now we've become a little bit more aware. We're a bit more mindful mm -hmm. of the no obstacles <laughs> and the, the nature of the, of the challenge. So yeah. what do we do? Well, exactly what you've mentioned. Now we're noticing that we have to inspire uh, people in position of authority a little bit better. We get our leadership mm -hmm. in, in better shape. And therefore, it won't be false hope anymore because you need leadership everywhere. And it's not just top leadership it's all not just positional leadership exactly exactly yeah and well you know what you're I, I like where you're going with this and actually my mantra is i do get up every morning to make people happier at work because i believe it'll make them happier in their lives and that you know quixotically perhaps lead, will lead to a better society and i'm doing my bit every day yeah 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 the only um variation that i have on your sentiment is i prefer to refer to to it as joy rather than happiness um because i can find joy in yeah, climbing, yeah, climbing yeah, a really yeah. steep hill right so my body's screaming yeah. at me you idiot you're killing me muscles burning and so on but there's such yeah. deep joy in in kind of making that achievement and when you're at yes, the top, yes you yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I the title of that book too uh, with the uh, menlo park uh, mm. uh company there joy yeah joy yeah. i just got i couldn't get past the viking helmets though but <laughs> <laughs> well that's their tradition yeah, yeah. Yeah, Rich Sheridan is, a, is, a, is an awesome yeah, chap. Richard Sheridan, yeah. yeah. <laughs> very well. All well, right. Daniel, this was really a, a very insightful and a great honor to have you on The Focus. Oh, and, it's, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And thank you for, for joining us today. Um, I'm Aldo Roll. This is The Focus. I'm Jorge Stoshansky. And again, welcome, Daniel. Thank you, guys.